So I'm talking about Marinette under the magnifying glass because when I'm developing either a new feature or I'm debugging, I'm always using the inspector. And I'm often using small dev tools that I've written to understand our Marinette app, both like the view layer, the data layer, the router, uh, the radio for message passing. I love looking into the app to understand how it works. And I talked to other people. I was talking to someone, James Smith, who's on Core, Jamius. He's a fantastic engineer. And I was making the point that this is a really powerful tool. And he's like, but I just console log. And I think a lot of people do this. And they can get a lot done. And they think through the app and how it works and read a lot of code and understand how it works. And then they implement a new feature. But to me, that seems crazy. And I think there's a really different approach you can take when you constantly are using the tools available to understand the app. And this approach uh, was codified by Brett Victor, who gave a talk a couple years ago called Inventing on Principle. And his whole thing is that if you're building a running application, there's a lot of state. There's a lot of interaction. And if you can build tools into the app to understand the app, you can develop with like, much greater ease. And he, he gave the example of like, maybe building Mario Bros. And you've got like, Mario there jumping, wants to jump on the turtle, and then go to the ledge and not land in the water. And you've got the code on the right, and you've got the game on the left. And if you just read the code, it's all static. And it's hard to understand. And it's hard to understand the impact of changing the code. So he highlights the number 45 there, which is the y velocity. And when he does that, a small slider opens. And he can change the value and see how Mario's trajectory changes. On the top, there's another slider for time. So as you move the top one, Mario like, moves forward and back in time. And by showing us how to add in tooling, he gives us a metaphor for a much better interactive environment where you can get feedback on how the application is performing. Like if I were to build this and then constantly change the number and refresh and then like play the game again, it would be really frustrating. I wouldn't get a lot of information out of it. But if I have this great tooling environment, I can understand the workings of the app much, much faster. The extreme example is this one. Does anyone recognize this? It's really ancient. And I'd be really impressed if someone does. This is the Smalltalk VM running in Squeak. And what made Smalltalk really special is that everyone in the 90s <laughs> were programming inside of the application itself. It's like opening up Chrome and then editing all the code in the inspector. There were no files that you'd save and then refresh the browser. You would actually like, open up the app and then start editing. The way you create a new app would be like to create like a template, start the app with just like your template, and then edit inside the application itself. And this the reason why I show this is because small talk developers who are looking at application development today think we're crazy for having like Sublime and all these files that you save and then you execute and then you load and then like you see if it works as opposed to having your application running and then being able to ask the app what are the classes available? What are the instances? How does it work? And then make changes on the fly. So it's a totally different perspective to application development. And I think we can do the same thing in the browser. What makes the browser so interesting is it is this application environment that's long lived that gives you everything you need right here. So the entire talk will be how to use that thing on the right so you understand the thing on the left. And a lot of these tools are going to be really obvious, and hopefully some of them you haven't seen before. So this is kind of a lightning talk. So I'm just going to show a bunch of examples and see what you've seen before and then go from there. I don't really have a script, so I'm just winging it. This is a small Marinette example for showing lists. All the code can be seen right here. I didn't write this code. I barely understand it. But I can use the tools to understand what's going on. And that's kind of what I want to show you. So the first thing is I'm always setting breakpoints, because I want to see the application running and all the scope. So if I refresh, the code stops executing on line 20 right before the render method. And 
At this point, I have a call stack, which is really powerful. I have all the scope variables, which is really nice, and all the globals. This is not my computer, so I'm a little bit confused why there are no locals here, but that's fine. I can run with it. If I type in the console list view, I get the instance of the view I'm about to render. I can check to see if it has an EL in there. That's kind of cool. So I see right now that there's a UL that probably will like be shown right here. I'm not really sure. And it doesn't have anything in it yet. Once I render it, I can get that EL again, and it will have something. Cool, a UL with some LIs, and it's now shown on the list. Ah, um, so Backbone has EL and dollar $EL. Dollar $EL is the jQuery version. So I can do things like .html and go grab the inner HTML, which is how I got this thing. If I want to map from the list back, I can go into the Elements tab. I can go find this guy, get this UL, and then in the console, I can do $1, and I have the LI that I just clicked on, which is kind of nice if I want to like, introspect on it, that kind of thing. If I'm looking at the code and I want to do the same thing, I'm just going like, to jump to WebStorm. I can pull up the code we were just looking at. And type debugger. Debugger is a magic statement the actor knows to look for and then crash. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that again. Cool. Uh, so it's just like setting a breakpoint. It stops execution. I can look at all the context variables and also play in the console. Do things like list view. Is that specific to the This is JavaScript. This is a JavaScript keyword that the browsers know when they're building out inspectors to leverage. You can even do this in Node as well. Does it hold on to cache at that point? What do you mean? So it was running from the top. It saw this line and just stopped. It's like freezing the VM. And the only way we can look at this is that the inspector is running in its own uh, window execution, and it can talk to it. As like the browser, its world has just been frozen. But it's frozen in a really convenient place. We can see all the scope variables. We can look at the call stack, which at this point like, isn't that useful, and then start using these debugger tools just like step over and then step down. So it like, gives you a w way to like, stop time and then do things you want to do. When I was learning Backbone, I was constantly using debugger to stop somewhere and then see what happened. Like, how many people have stepped into a render method or Backbone on handler or things like that? I did that all the time. I still do that all the time. What makes Marinette so interesting is we have all these view classes. We have like the layout class, the item view, the collection view. They all have separate render methods. To understand the subtleties, I went directly to the debugger and then just stepped into it. So this is doing a list view render from, no, it's doing an item view render. So we can see that the way it works is it serializes the data from the model. I know that because serialized data just like looks for the model and calls to JSON. It goes, grabs the template, and then renders the HTML, which is exactly what we were looking at before, and then plops it into the EL, which we were looking at before as well. Maybe looking at how an item view renders is like not the most exciting thing, but if you have a bug, this is the best way to figure out what's going on and how the internals work. It's not that scary. It's not as scary as looking at Ember or Angular or React, which is 50,000 lines of code. This is totally accessible. So my second example is a slightly more complicated app. So over here, 
we've got tabs. If I click on this one, it says James, Sam, Cobweb, Derek. These are all people who've worked on Marinette at some point. And I didn't write this code either. So this is going to be a little bit more exciting because it's more complicated. There's more stuff. And my first question is just like, how do these tabs work? All I know when I'm looking at this is that the content changes. So if I wanted to understand this, and this like applies to really complicated apps, I would go back to the elements tab. And all I know is that this div changes. So I'm going to set a breakpoint on the HTML for whenever anything in the subtree has changed. This is like super power user. Has anyone used this before? One, two, yeah, we were talking about this earlier. This is one of my favorite JavaScript things because you never know where events are handled. Like if someone wrote a lot of jQuery, they bound a lot of events, you don't know where it was set up. So all I know is that the subtree changed, so I'm gonna break on that. And that means when I click here, a breakpoint was set all the way down here and jQuery caught it and wanted to handle it. jQuery isn't interesting, but Marinette is. So this is three up. And what that's saying is that there was a view that had a click handler, and when that was executed, update body was called, and in this method, we wanted to take the tab layout and reshow the body as a new content view with this model. I really don't know what this model is, so I can go look at it. I see that like the username's Cobweb, and he's Australian. This is the first time I've looked at this. <laughs> I can render a new content view. I can, so that just instantiate a new content view called X. I can render it. I can take a look at the EL and see it's going to say hello from Cobweb. If I show it in the body, so I'm just going like, to try doing that. And voila, it says hello from Cobweb. So like, that's how it works. There's like some view somewhere that renders a content view, shows it in the tab layout body. I, didn't know, I did not even have to understand the code to understand like, where to start debugging this. Recently, there have been two new features added to the inspector that have been truly magical. The first is async. And this is a piece of like browser magic that is really, really hard to implement on JavaScript. The problem is that there are a bunch of things that are asynchronous about JavaScript, like set timeout, Ajax. You know, I like find some user handler events, I click, and then it's going to be triggered later. Uh, network events can be asynchronous. And you want to preserve a call stack. Yet call stacks are like inherently synchronous. X invokes B invokes C. It's three deep. And then there's a set timeout. This call stack is going to be broken. Async keeps that. So everyone says that live programming is bad. It really is. But I'm going to try. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is change update body to foo. So it calls a foo function. And if you see any typos, just let me know. I'd rather hear it in advance. All right, cool. So instead of calling update body, we're now going to call foo, which is going to wait for 20 milliseconds and then call update body. Why is this interesting? Because if I don't have async enabled, I'm going to learn almost nothing about the code. So I'm going to set a breakpoint at update body, click on Sam, and my call stack just says that like update body was called. I have no idea who called it, and there's no context like how I got here. So continue on, enable async, run this again, and now I have a really rich call stack that says there was a set timeout. And oh, by the way, Foo was the one who did the set timeout and then called update body. So if there's a bug, I now know where it came from. That's really exciting. Another one is this little octagon up here, like this stop sign. 
And if I decide to pause on caught exceptions, let's actually not pause on caught exceptions. I'll show you what happens if it just breaks. So in update body, I'm going to call bar here. There is no bar function. This is going to blow up. I'll call Sam. Oh, there's that breakpoint. So all right, Re refresh. Call cobweb. All I know right now is that there was an exception because bar wasn't defined. It's a reference error. I have no idea like why this might have happened. I turn on, I refresh again. I turn on pause on caught exceptions. I go to cobweb. Now I'm in the call stack again. I see that foo called into update body. And if I look in the scope variables, I see that there's an exception with a message bar is not defined. Because I'm still in the context, I can figure out the source of the bug and understand how I got here. This is a really powerful feature when you're debugging complicated Marinette apps. And like some event happened somewhere, and you want to know like why this blew up. Like often you're not using just bar, you're doing like this dot foo dot bar, and foo's undefined, and undefined like doesn't have bar. So you want to like figure out how you got here and like figure out why foo is undefined. So that's a power feature that I love using. So up to this point, these have all been like generic JavaScript things that you can do. What I found with Marionette is because we all follow common patterns, we can leverage those patterns to figure out things that are like might be backbone specific. So if I were adding a new feature to this tab, I'd want to know all the events that are triggered as soon as I went to this tab. So to figure that out, I can look at like Marionette dot view dot prototype dot trigger. All right, so every view uses the trigger function to call all the events. So all the events go through trigger, which is useful, because now I can monitor this function. Yeah, this is awesome. Monitor is built in Chrome. I go to Sam, or I go to Cobweb, and I see all of the events right here. Wow. Yeah. This is, I use this all the time. Let's say I want to look at the color view, and I want to set a breakpoint on foo, maybe. The other really cool console feature is debug. Now, when I go to Cobweb, it stops on foo. This is, I should have said this earlier on, this is an alternative to using debugger or the breakpoints. This one's really useful if you want to like set breakpoints on radio command handlers or views that you don't, like, don't have a reference to like, from the console. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Two other things, and I can't really give you great examples for these, so I'll just like allude to it, they're coming soon. We should also be able to log radio events because our apps are complicated and you want to know all the messages going through the system, even if they're not coming through like a backbone view event. So like, that's really important. The other one, and the reason why I named the talk what I did, is you want to be able to hover over any element on the page and find the view that created it and all the bounds that are tied to it. So if I were to hover over Sam, I should know that there's a view bound to this tab, and this view has a model with attributes like Sam and whatever, or if I went to Cobweb, like it had an attribute cool, he's Australian, I should have all that data available by associating the DOM, which I can look at and click on, with the app that's under like backing it. And that's also coming soon. And these are all part of like a general topic of like understanding the app and all the app concepts, in addition to just understanding the code that backs it and like the fact that's running with all like the generic tools. And yeah, so that's my talk. <laughs>